things can be done. We're running a little behind now. Maybe our live streamers have decided to go. <laughs> OK. Welcome back. I hope you had a good tea and felt stimulated by your discussions at tea. I'm going to open this discussion with a couple of minutes from Bill to literally just have a quick snapshot reflection from what we've heard. Because we've had a break between the speakers speaking and are coming back in the room, Bill will offer just something to help you get back into the zone or the frame. Um, and then we will start to gather some questions. We'll invite at some point during that initial phase some of the comments from our live streamers. We have, uh, we've had up to 42 live streamers taking part um, and they have contributed some thoughts. So we will invite those and then I will ask the panel to sort of come in and out of the discussion as it feels relevant to the questions and contributions that we make. So we'll try and leave that a bit fluid and see how we go. Please feel free to ask the big questions. Those are the ones we kind of want to get to. Um, so Bill, perhaps you could kick us off. Thanks Liz. I'm Bill Vorley from IIED in London and um, one of the sort of red threads through this series of provocations. Uh, the first one, by the way, we had in The Hague in um, September, and you have the, a short report of that on your, on your seats and available on, for download. And that was a, a, an interesting discussion on producer agency and markets, and um, it had a strong link with some of the presentations this morning, in that there was a strong emphasis, not just in terms of smallholders, cooperating to compete in markets, but also the importance of organization and agency to shape the rules that make markets poor or anti-poor in the way that the modalities and the, the markets frameworks work or don't work for small-scale farmers. And I, I picked that up a lot from the presentations. So Olivier uh, de Schutter said that rights-based and market-based approaches there is a false dichotomy. What we need is a, a rebalancing and a localization of the food system to, for inclusiveness and resilience. And, um, and a rights framework is helpful in shaping that kind of reframing and rebalancing. Diana said, be careful, rights do not avoid problems of power and the powerful can in influence any system. And I, I think that was a hel helpful real life um, warning against uh, the legal implementation of a rights-based approach. Satish said that farmers are enterprising but as entrepreneurs they, they need to set their own terms of trade otherwise they're going to be exposed to very high risk and he's talking about looking beyond the discourse of rights to a discourse of sovereignty as a, as a starting point for this kind of debate and interventions from the Swedish government uh, really marked, a, I felt, a shift in thinking in the Swedish government f uh, in f towards favoring rights and soft law to guide legislation and, and programs, though definitely still grappling with uh, how to balance an emphasis on small-scale and large-scale farming. Andre talked about virtual versus vicious cycles in, in which the state can tilt markets um, and, and invest in a very important sector, a sector with a lot of advantages, which is small-scale farming, to create spaces for smallholders such as school meals and buttressing that with, uh, with a minimum price, uh, for instance, and, and short chains. So really using the power of the market rather than declaring war on it. And lastly, um, Galia uh, really mentioned, really focused on the fact that only organized producers have the power in the market to, to both compete and to lobby the government for the policies and resources which they need. He, he told us not to confuse needs-based and rights-based approaches. Rights build empowerment and agency. 
into uh, development rather than a needs-based approach. And of course, rights and agency are about process, and he warned against crude results-driven policy that is blind to process and blind to capacity. So those, those are my quick, horribly short take-home messages just to get the discussion going uh, for this next round. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Bill. That's perfect. Okay, so let the floor is open. Uh, please start to chip in your thoughts. We can gather some questions uh, and reflections at this point. We will also have some from our live stream guests. Who would like to start? I I'd just like to check too quickly where the uh, microphone is. Great. Olivia, we have a comment at the back. Yeah. If you'd like to just give your name and your affiliation right at the back on the left um, so that people know who, who they're speaking to and with. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Mike Jones. Um, I wear a number of different hats. Firstly, in my native land, I'm an indigenous peasant farmer. <laughs> Secondly, I spent something like 40 years knocking around in Africa and 25 of those were spent working with small-scale farmers working with them on conservation and development issues. And then the third hat that I wear is a fairly new one. I'm based at the Stockholm Resilience Center where I've been thinking about resilience theory and how it relates to real world problems. Having listened to, to the, the various panelists present their, their views on this dichotomy, um, the first thing I think is that the only person who really spoke to me, who really struck a chord with me, was PV. He sounds like a real farmer or somebody who really understands the problems from a farmer's perspective. They are far more complex than either being rights-based or market-based. Not only is that a false dichotomy, even if you bring the two of them together, they are not sufficient to deal with the complexities of the issues that you're trying to deal with. So, and that's, that's not just my experience as a farmer and a, and a development worker, but also my experience as, a, as somebody who thinks about these things in terms of complex systems and resilience and how resilience ideas might be applied to helping unravel some of these complexities. I think my question for the panel, and it picks up on what PV said, is the, the need for food sovereignty. Now, it's, I've heard that word. I'm not really familiar with what it means. I think I know what it means. But it seems to be related to something similar, which is food security. Now, listening to what PV said, I think sovereignty actually means something a lot broader than simple food security. So I'd like to ask PV and then maybe the rest of the panel to, to comment on what these words mean and how they might lead to a better understanding of the complexities of the problems that we're trying to deal with. Thank you. Would anyone else like to add some issues and thoughts around that theme before we invite panel contribution? Have we got anything from our live streamers on a similar vein? Not necessarily by the looks of things. <laughs> so no one else wants to contribute to that. So panelists, we have an issue here around complexity. PV, do, would you like to uh, dive in? OK. Um, thanks for your appreciation. But I also think that the others made very significant comments, and not just me. It's only that you are a farmer and I'm a farmer, and so we strike a card. But there are many other cards in between. <laughs> anyway, to come back to your question, you see, we, as an organization, we work for almost 10, 15 years uh, out of our 25 years of existence on the principle of food security. But then we soon understood that this doesn't solve our problems. Uh, in 2003, by, the, by which time we had moved away from the food security uh, platform, but 2003, what happened in India further confirmed our thoughts. That was the year when the Indian government godowns were full of 65 million tons of extra food. But then at the same time, people in eastern part of Orissa were dying of hunger. So there was no point in having a national food security and thinking of that as a false uh, hope of food security. Food security must come down to the 
every single household and when a household is food secure then there can be a food security and for a household to be food secure it is not the quantum of food that you can access but it's the quantum of nutrition and food that you can produce on your own farms if you are a food producer never compromise on the issue of your right to produce and stay with that right to produce and produce as many diverse kind of uh, foods that you can and in India today we are talking about nutritional emergency and that means that uh, we are 128th in the human nutrition index in the world though we are supposed to be one of the giant economies of the world and we are far below sub-Saharan Africa. I think that's because of the superior food system that that's uh, available in sub-Saharan Africa and the terrible, terrible uh, kind of foods that we feed our people, foods that are produced uh, uh, through a lot of chemical means in some centralized systems. So to me, a yeah, food sovereignty in terms of farmers and in terms of food eaters, it means this, that I must have an access to nutritional food and as a food producer, I must have the right to produce the kind of food I want in as diverse a manner as possible and non-chemical man manner as possible on my own farm. And this is not a dream. This is something that 5,000 women of the Deccan Development Society have been able to achieve. And today, they feed their own communities and they don't wait for the government to feed them. Thank you. Any comments from the floor? Or we can have more comments from our panel members? I would like to add, if he's not reacting, PV. A very good definition of food sovereignty. How does that relate to food security? Are they treated as synonymous? No, that, that was a very good response. Thank you. Uh, but I'm not. I'm still not sure whether sovereignty, food sovereignty, and food security are treated as synonymous, or whether in the policy discourse they're used in in slightly different ways. Because policy I think it's important. Policy discourse hasn't yet grappled with the issue of food sovereignty, at least yeah, in my part of the world. Yeah. It is still limited to food security. And uh, nowadays, there are more and more perverse definitions of food security. Even some of the leading civil society uh, movement people also just say that as long as people are fed, even with the genetically engineered crops, we are satisfied. I think that comes out of a urban-based movement which doesn't have anything to do with rural realities. I stop at that. Carol, Edith, I saw vigorous nodding. Do you want to say anything about this? Thank you. Yeah, my name is Edith van Walsum. I work with uh, ILEA, the Center for Learning on Sustainable Agriculture based in the Netherlands, part of a global network of like-minded <coughs> organizations. Um, just one little comment to, uh, to further build on this uh, question and answer regarding food sovereignty and uh, food security. I think one issue important to realize when we talk about food security, it's very often understood in a very pretty narrow manner in terms of uh, caloric security. Food security at macro level is very often referred to production of rice, maize and wheat as the big uh, suppliers of uh, food calories. But nutrition security and food sovereignty are much more than that and I think well that's what I wanted to add but anyway I had a question or something going through my mind regarding this whole uh, debate that we are having today um, where uh, the question is is uh, is there a false dichotomy between markets on the one hand and uh, the, the, the rights-based approaches on the other hand I was wondering how this links to another dichotomy, which might also be a false dichotomy, and that is the dichotomy that small farmers are there to feed themselves and large farmers are there to feed the world. And I wanted to throw it on the floor because I have no answer to this and I think it's a very uh, well complex issue as well. But especially the relation between one dichotomy and the other is the thing that is going through my mind as a big question. Edith, thanks for that question. I hope we can hold that one because I had a couple of other points, I think, on the food security issue. So we will come back to that. 
Michelle, is your point on food security? Because I have a queue. Thank you, Hannah. And then this gentleman on the end, and then Michelle. Hannah over there. Uh, it's a man called Eduardo Morena who has written this question and it relates to one of the farmers' organizations called Via Campesina who has been promoting food sovereignty. Uh, and he says, throughout the different interventions I've heard people alternatively oh, sorry, talk about smallholders, family farmers, peasant farmers. In other words, you, you each seem to refer to the different terms but at the same time, you all imply that they all apply to a shared social group with a common set of characteristics, problems and demands. This, for me, echoes the Bia Campesina discourse on the peasantry. In this regard, I was wondering what your thoughts were on the Bia Campesina decision to promote a declaration of, of peasant rights at the UN level, uh, as has been the case for indigenous rights. And more generally, do you agree with the idea that a common set of peasant rights can and should be promoted at the international level. Okay, can I collect the other question from this gentleman at the end and then we will... My name is Lasse Kranz, I work at the Swedish SIDA. Uh, <coughs> it's back to food sovereignty again. Uh, it's just a question in coming to my mind. Uh, earlier we also heard that the, the, the importance of uh, linking the countryside also with the cities. We have a growing urban population and the assumption was that more of the, of the, the, the food production um, would, was going to be produced also domestically, so to speak, by the nearby local producers. Now, is there a contradiction with this and the food sovereignty conception, which I understand is primarily emphasizing self-sufficiency? and subsistence production. Yeah, <coughs> I, I'd like to help clarify this distinction. Bit, oh, sorry, my name is Michel Pinbert. I coordinate the food and agriculture um, team at IID, the International Institute for Environment and Development. And I'd like to revisit this um, dichotomy that's been established between food security and food sovereignty. I mean, food security is a very important concept and it's about ensuring um, uh, people's access to food, um, restricting entitlements and so on. Uh, but the, the way it's used uh, currently uh, in the dominant discourse is that it tends to underplay the importance of where food comes from, how it's produced, who produces it, and on what terms, and with what kinds of impacts. It's very much a construct that says that food security should be obtained uh, primarily through the market. It's about buying food, access in that sense, not access to productive resources. The food sovereignty paradigm, because I think it is a paradigm, um, is actually an innovation, a conceptual innovation that has come out of the ranks of farmers and marginalized farmers and indigenous peoples. And it's been proposed as an alternative to the neoliberal framework for food and agriculture and land use. There have been lots of discussions within social movements and peasant organizations to elaborate this alternative framework. And maybe I could just say that there are some salient features. First, the fundamental right of people to define their food and agricultural policies. A democratic right to define the rules of the game. Second, the right to food and everything which Olivier has been working on. Third, stressing the importance of agroecological models of production and systems of production that are embedded in natural <coughs> processes and have low ecological footprints and are climate resilient and are also locally controlled. And another important principle is the question of gender equitable access to resources, to land, to seeds, to water, to forests and their products and to knowledge. Very, very important. Another um, dimension of the food sovereignty paradigm is about trade. At no point have farmer organizations said that they're against trade or markets. 
However, um, the kind of economic exchanges proposed in the food sovereignty paradigm are about strengthening local markets, regional markets, what Olivier was talking about in Satish, and putting in place protective safeguards for domestic markets. In other words, strong measures to prevent the dumping of subsidized foods uh, from the north that destroy markets for local producers, livestock herders, and so on. Um, now, those are some very important defining elements of the food sovereignty paradigm, which I think distinguish it very fundamentally from the dominant food security narrative, which the FAO uses, the World Bank, and many university and policy think tanks still. But I think it's to the credit of people out there in the field who've actually taken the conceptual initiative to reinvent a vision for food and farming based on equity, inclusion, democracy, dynamic adaptation. And there's a lot of discussion and elaboration of what this paradigm means in practice and what would be needed in terms of policy and institutional innovations, as well as redire redirecting food and agricultural research. So I'll just stop with that. I hope that it clarifies the difference. Thank you. Uh, on our panel, who would like to reply? Olivier. Just w one word to, to, to say how uh, absolutely correct uh, Michel Pember is in, 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 in describing with these uh, four components this paradigm of, of food sovereignty despite the various definitions around the concept. Um, what I would like to emphasize in, in relation to the question of Eduardo uh, on the Declaration on Peasants' Rights is that maybe there is um, still something um, else in the food sovereignty paradigm, which is a right of access to productive resources, uh, protection of land, protection of access to natural resources more generally, protection of the right to use, exchange seeds, uh, the right to reuse seeds uh, which, you've, uh, uh, which you've collected from your, from your harvest. Um, and the right to food means different things for different people. Um, it is not the same thing for the urban dweller than for the, for the farmer. But for the farmer, it certainly means being protected in one's right to produce food on which one's um, incomes depend and one's uh, access to food depends. And so um, the Peasants' Rights Declaration is important because for many years we've treated um, food security as indeed the main paradigm, the, the dominant concern was to ensure that everybody had a minimum amount of, of calories uh, to which he or she should have access to, without asking the very important questions that the food sovereignty movement asks, which is who produces, um, for whom, on which terms, and, and with which long-term consequences. And so it is basically um, not treating the right to food as simply satisfying basic needs, but treating the right to food as something that requires um, empowerment, self-determination, and, and for the farmers, indeed, access to productive resources. The Peasants' Rights Declaration, I think, is very important because it will highlight for policymakers um, the, the danger of basically um, um, uh, this world uh, disappearing on which we depend for our future resilience uh, in a context where we will need not less but more farmers to, 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 to produce for the world. Yeah. Anyone else like to comment on this point? PV? Yes. Mm. Um, um, elaborate a little on the points that were made. I, I would like to call myself a microman. <laughs> though it's though it's the name of a mobile company which I hate. <laughs> uh, but, but the point I wanted to make was the issue of self-sufficiency and um, subsistence agriculture. If you take self-sufficiency, we must recognize that it's not always the dumping is between north and the south. There is intranational dumping also. In my country, two or three states produce everything for the rest of the country and mm. completely destroy local agriculture in 70% of the country. We, we are very, very aware of that and we are fighting against that. That's number one. Number two is, if you look at su su sufficiency, self-sufficiency as a set of concentric circles, and at the smallest circle, take as a rural farming household, it starts from there. And once that that, that household becomes self-sufficient, then it starts spreading to the community, to the local area, and then the larger 
regional area. I say this because it has been possible for the 5,000 women of the Deccan Development Society to do this within 10 years. They started off as people who had no food production of their own, but today they are producing for the community and also serving a market which I described. My last point is the word subsistence agriculture. I think we need to use that word with a lot of respect and not the kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, demeaning, ter demeaning term it has been reduced to. I think as long as we have a subsistence vision of agriculture and development, then it also uh, becomes a part of the ecological vision of agriculture. Subsistence, people use it with a lot of uh, respect for every use of resources that they do. And because of them, we are still having certain resources left for that. If you have lost that subsistence vision, then the world would have gone by now. Thank you. Okay. Can uh, I add something? Yeah, of course. Yeah, uh, because I think I was not eloquent in my presentation. Uh, because I see this, this initiative from the Brazilian government that I was reporting here, I think it's pretty much aligned with this idea of food sovereignty. In the sense that if you are promoting local markets, if you are promoting a whole range of products, if you are promoting other alternative to market the product, I think this is pretty much aligned with the idea of uh, food sovereignty. And also, uh, uh, if you think in terms that the farmers, they will have more opportunities to produce their food and to market the, their, pro, their products, I think that resilience in this case is an emerging property of this very complex systems, combining ecological and economic alternative for farmers. Okay. Any further comments on this point? Yes, response. And we'll come back to Edith's question, I think. Um, Rebecca Oliver from the Telberg Foundation. I, I actually found your presentation extremely eloquent. And I thought that um, really for many different markets, not just food, uh, the role of the government in, in um, promoting those markets is, is critical. And we've talked about procurement in many ways mm -hmm. as being the way to stimulate markets that are not currently um, functioning. And, um, and really the, exa the examples that you were giving were, were procurement examples. Yeah. Um, and so I'd be interested in what the rest of the panel say, how are other countries finding ways to support the markets? Because surely the, the markets that have received the most support have been the large um, markets that are involved in export and in global trade. And now what needs to happen is either to reduce the power of those, now we realize that there are some risks associated, environmental risks or, or nutritional risks or, or what have you from cash crops, low nutrient uh, cash crops, Surely, you also need to bolster the, the local markets and the, and the small-scale uh, biodiversity supporting markets. So I, I thought it was a very, very interesting example indeed, and I would wonder what uh, the rest of the panel feel about that as, an, as, a, as ways to, uh, to, to, to provide government support for just what we're, we're talking about. Can I just... You want to comment directly? I have yeah. got... Um, this is obviously sparking off a few comments. We've got the question that Edith asked, uh, which I would like to go back to at some point. Edith, are you happy that we kind of roll with this for the, for the moment? And we'll give it a few minutes. So I've got a comment from Michelle and this lady and this gentleman. Do you want to dive yes, straight a back for a quick yeah, one? Yeah, 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 because of course I'm telling the pink picture, <laughs> but there's the other side. <laughs> I come from a very contradictory country, and, uh, and, and I'm talking about 2.5% that of smallholders that are reached by this policy. And if you think in terms of the amount of money, of resources that go to, the, to big business, to the agribusiness, it's a huge amount. So still, it's a, it's a power relation on that. I, 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 want to, I don't want to, 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 yeah, that I'm cheating anyone here. <laughs> okay, we had Michelle, then we had the lady in gray, and then we had the gentleman in gray. Then can you hold? Yes. Could we have the, la the lady of the grey jumper? Uh, 
thank you. My name is Katarina Eriksson. I represent the Tetra Laval Group, which includes Tetra Pak, uh, a company working with processing and packaging solutions and uh, for the food industry, and De Laval, uh, our sister company working with uh, the dairy farmers. Um, I can maybe partly answer the question that you just raised. Other governments that do similar things that, that the Brazil government do. We, uh, Tetra Pak has been working with school milk programs all over the world for the last 50 years. And uh, most of these programs are, are funded or regulated by, by governments. And in many, many cases, it's the ministries of agriculture that are behind these initiatives, just because they want to stimulate local production of uh, nutritious food that is very benefit, uh, uh, has a very uh, important um, uh, impact on, 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 on ch ch children's nutrition. Um, at, just to give you an idea of how, 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 how much we, we do on this is, is that l last year our Tetra Pak's packages were used in school feeding programs, mainly school milk programs in 54 countries. And uh, in, in most of these cases, um, the milk uh, distributors in schools are, are locally produced um, and very often also come from smallholders. We are now doing a, a, a pilot project in Zambia together with, uh, with CEDA and that's one of the requirements for this program, that the milk supply to children will come from smallholder farmers uh, to stimulate and, and, uh, and, and, and build local uh, production. And there are many examples of countries who have built their whole dairy industry on, 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 on these types of initiatives, school milk program. Kenya is one example, <laughs> um, that where the government for 20 years financed school, uh, school milk. And that's where the whole, that whole industry, all the investments, or, or a lot of the investments in that industry were, were, were made. Um, unfortunately, today there is, there is not a big school milk program in Kenya, but we have other countries. That th Thailand is another example, who built their whole dairy industry on, on school milk. Um, Iran uh, is, is doing the same thing, stimulating and, and, and um, uh, using the uh, excess supply of milk in the country to distribute in, in schools. And, and uh, well, I can give you a long, long, long list and I'm happy to answer more questions. But yes, I, we, we believe that this is a very good way of stimulating um, uh, development of a nutritious mm -hmm. uh, food that uh, has a great impact on, on children and, and all the way back to the value chain. Thank you. If we could have a comment from this gentleman. My name is Andrew Crogland. I'm the uh, Director of Information and Policy at the Norwegian Development Fund. Um, the, the concept and the paradigm of, of food sovereignty is extremely interesting. Um, and I wonder if someone could comment uh, on what would be the consequences if one were to go for that concept um, for <laughs> the trade negotiations because there seems to be uh, contradictions between the, the the concept the paradigm and the 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 the, the going um, uh, paradigms of the of the wto um, i also wonder if uh, how totalitarian if you like the, the the concept is because brazil for instance seems to be a very interesting country in the sense that you have a lot of these uh, very interesting things going on which has a lot to do with empowerment of poor people and food sovereignty at the same time you have an extremely modern uh, and monoculture production soy chopping down a forest uh, GMOs and stuff like that is it can one conceive of a country going for food sovereignty and at the same time keeping that type of production or is that just an inherent contradiction which has to be solved. And then just a question for later on, I'd like uh, the Schutter to comment upon what is happening in the, uh, in the Maghreb, in the North African region and the Middle East. Will the revolutions there have anything to say for food security in the region? Thank you. Thank you. Um, one more comment here. Is it on the same issue? Yeah, yeah. one more comment here. Thank you. Uh, uh, my name is Inge Jermo from the Royal Academy of, of Agriculture. Uh, just to also to relate on the latest question, I mean, here we talk about either you are a small farmer or are you, are, you are a large farmer. In the best of worlds, I have never heard about anything that you normally grow from a small farmer in, into something different. 
changing are done. Some, some people leave the, leave the countryside, hopefully in a good manner, but that is, so to say, the, the normal development in, in, in many countries. How do you look upon that when we talk about food sovereignty and food security? What kind of, what, what kind of world are, are you discussing, so to say? It, is it a, a world with always small farmers as they used to be? Or, 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 or what, what kind of, of things is going on in, in, in the next couple of decades, so to say? Thank you. Um, I wonder if the panel would like to um, answer the comment on um, the concept and implications for the WTO of food sovereignty. Then I think we could perhaps come back to the Maghreb question a bit later on and go to Edith's question on the other dichotomy that was raised. Does that seem a good way forward? Any comments, panel? Olivier. Well, uh, I think the, 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 qu the first question of um, Andrew Kroglin uh, concerning the impacts of the food sovereignty um, idea for uh, trade negotiations is quite linked, actually, to the question of Edith on, on uh, okay. who can feed the yeah. world and, and, yeah. and, and who should feed themselves. Um, I'm not speaking on behalf of any uh, organized movement such as the Via Campesina, and they will have, I'm sure, their own things to say on this. But essentially, uh, what food of sovereignty means is a right to choose, um, including a right to protect one's agricultural system from the impact of international trade so that the food and agricultural policies that are pursued are not determined by the rules of the international trading system. Now, some countries may choose to import in order to feed themselves um, if they do not have a productive capacity, if, and, and some countries will never be able to achieve self-sufficiency, and they have other ways of you know, uh, gaining resources, and, and, and they may make this choice democratically. But many countries actually have not made a choice. They've been forced into a position in which they've developed this dependency on international markets although they could um, better ensure their, um, uh, their um, uh, ability to feed themselves had they invested more into their local domestic production. And these countries are now realizing that they are in a very um, difficult situation because they've developed what I called earlier on this addiction to cheaply priced food on international markets, as a result of which their agricultural systems have been destroyed and they now have to plan their ability to climb up the ladder of self-sufficiency, which will make them much more resilient in the face of price shocks on the international markets, which in the future shall become uh, more severe and, and more frequent. So I think this is the direction in which um, they, are, they, they, they are thinking, but it is um, running counter to what many see as the future, which is lower barriers to, to, to trade in agricultural products um, and, and therefore um, um, uh, food circulating uh, with um, lesser uh, uh, possibilities for the countries to, to protect their, their borders. Now, we have to recognize at the same time that for certain um, food deficit regions, it is very important to be able to import food and, and, to, and to have um, um, international markets which are well functioning. But again, the question is, um, how will the choices be made and will the countries uh, be able to manage their short-term need to import with their long-term need to be more self-sufficient in, in food production? Um, one uh, second and, and much shorter comment I'd like to make is um, um, based on your question about the next 20 years and what is the kind of world we are envisioning. I'm sorry I didn't hear your name, but I think one key thing I'd like to emphasize is that while we are discussing a lot on the agricultural sector, we also should keep in mind the links between the agricultural sector and the other sectors of the economy. I do not think that it's a good idea to tell countries that they should specialize into agriculture at the exclusion of all the rest. The countries that are succeeding are countries which have a diversified economy, and the countries which are succeeding are the countries in which the linkages between agriculture and other sectors um, have been um, well managed, and, and this requires a good timing for these countries in their entry into, into international trade and, and globalization. And Brazil is indeed a country which has managed this balance, not just between small-scale and large-scale farming, but also between various, um, various sectors. Uh, I think, like many others, that um, countries who are 
as a result of international trading systems, um, forced to uh, produce raw commodities as their only source of revenues are countries which will never be able to climb up the ladder of development. So part of the uh, discussion on how to sustainably combat um, hunger is uh, how will a country manage these, these priorities and protect also its industries uh, when they are nascent industries uh, before uh, opening up to international trade. Okay, we have a comment from this lady here and we also have something from the live stream. Would the live stream like to go first? We still have questions from you, Michelle, in due course. Thank you. <laughs> okay, there's a question from Ibrahim. If fairness and markets have nothing to do with each other, is cash-based trade inherently unfair? What is the answer to that? Okay. Do we want to answer that directly, or would this lady like to contribute her comment if it will wait? We'll answer that directly then. Anyone like to comment on that point from the live stream, from the panel or elsewhere? Fire away, and we'll come back to it. My name is <coughs> Gunnar Axelsson Ekander, I represent Church of Sweden. And, and first, a very short comment on the issue on, on WTO compatibility with this food sovereignty. And I think the answer is quite simple as, as it is today, because any country who has signed the agreement on agriculture has promised not to increase their tariffs, which is to give away part of its national sovereignty uh, as to food policy. Uh, but I wanted to bring up, um, go back to, to the issue of local markets and how to stimulate them. Uh, and I think, first, we've said enough, not enough, but um, the issue of pr uh, procurement has been brought up, and I think it's a very important example that you've shown from, from Brazil. Uh, but you're also saying that you have minimum prices in Brazil as a guarantee prices, which, of course, is a very powerful tool when it comes to stimulating markets and, and guarantee a market for a farmer. Uh, However, it's also the kind of policy that we have had in EU for many years and created a lot of problems and we have hard times getting away from fixed prices. Now we have direct support and now we're struggling how to decrease the, um, the budget to the common agriculture policy. So um, I just think it's interesting to, <laughs> to look at is, is the EU way of supporting farmers. Is it only a bad example? Uh, could it be done? in better ways and how is it functioning in Brazil and, and is, uh, could it be used as a model because I think it's quite the most powerful tool when it comes to supporting farmers. It's really to guarantee them a, a price. Any reflection on that? Who would like to respond? Any response? Thank you, PV. I think in, in, in India, almost for the last 20 years or more, we have been following the minimum support prices for uh, food crops and uh, some commodity crops also, such as cotton. Um, but then what it has done is distort the entire food production system of the country. Whereas we had a far more diverse system, 65% of India without irrigated water produced millets and such other grains. 30% of India produced wheat and rice purely on irrigation in some of the most uh, fertile lands of the country. And so the entire agricultural production moved into those 35% and the entire food system of the country was based on it. We have something called public distribution system which is a rationing system for the poor which is a very good affirmative system. But then it has altered the food consumption patterns and food con culture of the people and has created to a large extent today's uh, malnutrition of the country. One of the recent studies says that 20% of India's diabetes is caused by the rice distributed in the public distribution system. So those kind of distortions can come. I'm not against the minimum support price for the farmers. It must be. But it must recognize the essential principles of ecological agriculture, biodiversity, and uh, remunerate 
and honor the farmers who maintain this on their farms. So we are arguing, we are, we are a group called Millet um, uh, uh, Mini, uh, Millet Network of India. And the Millet Network of India has said, like in UK, you have a, uh, what do you call it, what uh, support? L when people leave their lands follow, fallow? Set aside, like a set aside support in uh, UK, you support the uh, farmers who produce millets because they are conserving biodiversity, they are conserving water, they are conserving uh, ecology. So give three kinds of support for them and give them something like 10,000 rupees per acre. That will promote a lot of diverse kinds of productions on the farm and will also contribute to ecological and climate uh, change compliant uh, cropping system and increase the nutrition. And, and on the issue, can the small farmer feed uh, the, the, the country or the community? I think we have live examples. I don't want to get into a lot, large uh, explanation of it again and again, but all, it is suffice to say that today if 150 communities of women farmers from coming from the degraded ecological zones who completely support their community with the food production and food sovereignty why not it why can't it be possible for the rest of india that's our argument within the country and we can apply it globally also what what is lacking is all the confidence of the small farmers has been completely decimated in themselves and that confidence must return to them and once you are able to return it, then both the answers to our friend there, will the small farmers stay on the land? Certainly they will stay on the land. There are 10 different ways that they can stay in the community on the land and make their life productive as well as uh, very satisfying and their well-being can be assured. And those farmers who have left the land and gone into the cities in a country like India where 700 million people are farming people, their, their, their condition is absolutely pathetic and I don't think we should envisage that kind of a con condition for more and more farmers. We must see the ways how farmers can stay on the land and support themselves and also make the government not to abdicate its responsibility for the community, for the food sovereignty, for the climate, for the ecological well-being of the nation it, in supporting these kind of farmers. Thank you. Any comments on this question of confidence? Okay, well, well, that's fine. No, no one was leaping out of their seats at that moment. So, so my name is Maria Schulz, and uh, I'm working at uh, the, the Resilience and Development Program, Swed Bio, at Stockholm Resilience Centre. And um, I don't know if you are familiar with the debate on under the Rio Plus 20 on its two main topics, one on green economy and one on the institutional settings for international environmental governance uh, for the Rio Plus 20 conference next year, which is a follow-up, you know, from, from the UNSED conference uh, 92. And under the green economy debate, it's a dichotomy in between developing countries and developed countries. Uh, just on this subject, I would say that uh, maybe developing can developed countries promoting more and more sort of market-based solutions under the green economy hat, and uh, developing countries are raising issues, especially from Cuba, Venezuela, and Bolivia, and so, uh, regarding the rights-based approach. You know, that the, the state might have to to control and regulate the market if it's really going to serve for social aspects, equity aspects, distributional aspects, and, and a poverty per perspective. And uh, I just wondered if uh, you have been involved in this debate or anything. And also last week, UNEP released uh, a report on the subject, the Green, uh, green Economy uh, Initiatives report. And well, it's just a question if okay. you have been involved. That's lovely. It has been a, quite a bit of a discussion about that the agriculture side has been lacking. I mean, small-scale farmers' views have been lacking in the debate, uh, many things, so to speak, from developing countries. Do we have some other questions to gather around that issue uh, before we invite the panel response? I, I have, have Michelle who has some questions. Michelle, you may wish to put them now or wait, or we'll try and gather some more around this kind of green economy 
Thank you. Let's... Thank you. Yeah, I was. I was just. It's Michelle again. I, I was just thinking about um, the um, the terms of the debate sectors and some of the words that have been used, and um, it's really a, a reality check for me. Um, I, I'm wondering if um, if we're considering um, enough uh, the, the diversity of markets, or are we reducing the term markets to money-based? markets? Um, are we um, factoring enough an under understanding of the history of economics and economic exchange in which certainly there have been money-based markets but there have also been markets without the use of money such as barter markets, forms of solidarity and they've often been based on other values than private gain. Uh, they've often been explicitly based on values of reciprocity or the gift relationship, as in the case of the barter markets, which P.V. Satish described in Peru. And I, I wonder if it would help uh, give us more room for thinking if we shifted attention from markets, which seem to be defined or understood in terms of money-based markets, the dominant form, to bring in this richness of economic exchanges. And that suggests two questions to me, which maybe the panelists would like to comment on. Is there a, a need to rethink mainstream economics on the basis of radically different principles that stress not so much private gain and individualism, uh, but reciprocity, solidarity, the gift relationship, equity, inclusion? And with that, uh, what does that mean for the governance of markets and economic exchange? In the case of the barter markets, again, which were referred to, um, they are actually managed by a polycentric network of women groups who define the rules of the game. Not only the act of exchange and the gift relationship, because there are lots of gifts, but also um, the whole system and its relationship with the landscape and communities. Um, now, some people will immediately react, say barter markets were pretty inefficient. Well, we've been able to establish that the barter markets in the Andes um, uh, have a, an economic value. They, they, the, the exchanges of foods um, in terms of economic value are ten times the amount of economic value of the national food security program for that area. So it's not small in terms of economic transactions. But I think this, this raises very interesting theoretical questions and practical questions for donor organizations, for policy think tanks, and social activists who are looking for alternatives or, or better ways of recon reconciling rights and markets. Do we need to broaden our purview to talk about economic exchange in its many different forms rather than fixate on money-based markets? Uh, we shoot ourselves in the foot, perhaps. And if we talk about forms of governance, certainly networks of uh, polycentric organizations, local organizations, but also uh, people's assemblies, uh, communal assemblies and citizen federations. Uh, this takes us in a very different realm, uh, probably the realm which Karl Polanyi stressed when he said there was a need to re-embed economics in society. It's a major project, a major practical and theoretical project. And I, and political project at this point in time as part of redefining the rules of the game. And I, I wanted to invite comments from the panelists. What would, if you agreed with that, if you didn't think it was a totally utopian, unpractical idea, what are the implications, say, for CEDA, for DFID, for policy think tanks like IID, uh, for the UN organizations, for local municipal governments? I'm trying to be provocative. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Michelle. Before the panel answer those questions, I wonder if we've got any other comments from the floor on this question of diversity of markets or mainstreaming economics on different principles. C can we um, kind of get some further feedback? Governance, different ways of governance. Uh, and then we'll perhaps ask the panel to, to come back. Yeah, thank you. I think Michelle's really hit on on the core of one of the major issues that affect us as a global society. It's, it's our understanding of economic theory and how that economic theory has been translated into what we think of as markets today. There's, I think there's a growing 
um, set of opinion that says economic theory as it currently stands and is currently understood by most is really badly flawed. It needs to be replaced by something new. And once you've got that something new, then you can start to think very seriously about the kinds of suggestions that uh, Michel was making, that we can have a whole range of different kinds of markets trading in a whole range of different things other than just money. And that, I think, gives you a, a completely different foundation for establishing relationships between people and also relationships between people and the environment. Thanks. Anyone else with a perspective on this? Perhaps some experience of working with a community or some other practitioner kind of experience you'd wish to share? Or other ideas? Panelists, I think we're over to you for some response. Or PV or Olivier or Anyone Diana, or all of you. Takes over, I'm very tempted to say something. Like that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I have three of I you immediately like to, yeah. wanting to respond, sorry, so you can like decide. <laughs> Please feel free. Can I? Yes. Um, <clears throat> you see, before I became a development uh, activist, I was a media practitioner and a media teacher. So I taught television in a number of universities in India and international organization, organizations. Media by itself is extremely competitive, and media education is equally competitive. So all the time I used to see my students coming up after an exercise and saying, did I do well, sir? Was, was I very good? And then uh, about 15 years ago, I uh, completely discarded that uh, part of my life. And I started working with these women whom I have already described. And we set up a media group among them, non-literate, very poor women coming from farming backgrounds. And every time we finish an exercise and I want to go to the next exercise, the women would say, look, this woman hasn't still come up to the level we wanted. Let her come up to that level, then we move to the other exercise. Gives you one perspective. And when I was coming to uh, uh, Stockholm, I traveled by Finnair and I was reading their magazine and they were talking about the reindeer race. And they were saying the problem with reindeer race is that they don't want to race each other. They always run with each other. And so they have to train the reindeer to race each other. So this is the kind of paradigm we have put into our markets. Communities which want to coexist and work with each other, we are making them through artificial means to have cutthroat competitions between them and reach to a market. This is the best way of working with human beings, is my question. Mm. <laughs> so, Olivier, Diana, who would like to? Diana. Okay, I want to um, step back a little bit, but then end up, I think, where Michelle, um, the question Michelle posed. I mean, reflecting on some of the earlier comments that were made, made, I would say that, in general, I think, compared to dialogues around um, organized groups of the urban poor, the, the audience has a lot of faith in the state. And I think the suspicion of the urban poor towards a rights-based approach is the fact that they are reluctant to see the state as able to solve their problems because the state is a site of contestation and around that contestation the poor often lose out. So I think there's a skepticism. That is not to say that rights are unimportant to them. That's not to say that they do not care passionately about being treated equitably. They are suspicious about how effective that approach is going to be. They are even more suspicious when international institutions adopt this discourse because their experience of international institutions is they're great on discourse and very strong on having, a very weak on having an impact on the ground. So in that context, I think for those groups, um, and I'm thinking particularly of two networks I work very closely with, Jacques or Slum Dwellers International and the, some of the community groups around the Asian Coalition for Housing Rights. In, in that context, actually, they, they would pick up and identify, perhaps with some of the comments of my fellow panelists, that the critical challenge is how to be, build strong local organizations that can contest whatever dominant anti-poor um, group they're up against. And they have to be nimble, they have to be swift, they have to be... Um, forward-thinking and strategic. What it does seem to me, based in the area in which I work, is there has been relatively little to draw together organized groups of the urban poor and organized groups of the, those who have low incomes and are excluded in rural areas. And clearly, if you're talking about food issues, it becomes very difficult to advance on those issues if you do not have those kinds of 
um, shared exchanges, thinking, um, thought and considerations. So as I'm sure any of you who've worked a little bit in towns and cities know, the urban poor are desperate for low-cost food. Many of them are malnourished, they do not earn enough, wage levels are often not even enough to take account of their daily needs, let alone their monthly needs. And they work in labour markets, which means they m mine their labour essentially until they have none left. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that they have very short-term goals. I think in general it means that they do not see a social protection system as the answer because they see a social protection system as reinforcing their dependence on a potentially hostile state and they see it as reinforcing individual orientation to their challenges whereas what they feel is a need for a collective response. And nor does it mean that they want to say the state is not part of the solution, they just want to make sure that they do it on, um, that they're successful when they engage the state. I think in terms of the question that... Um, that Michelle raised particularly, I think for me, it's a very open one. I think that the groups I know, the urban poor groups, are very sceptical about non-market-based systems, about barter trading, because they feel in some sense that they are forced to exist in the market. They're forced to, to, to sell their labour on the market. They are essentially are entirely dependent on a commodified system. So for me, what, what they want is an open question because we have not invested, and by we I mean the kind of the international development community, we have not invested sufficient in letting these groups see what their options are and work out for themselves what they want to further. So whilst I think they are sceptical about solutions that take them outside a market economy, which is absolutely dominant for them, both for survival and indeed for, for success and aspiration, they are equally conscious that in order to meet their food needs, they need to secure food from, from rural areas. They often have many links with those rural areas, and they know we are equally mining resources in those rural areas that threaten their long-term security if they can afford to think about it. So for me, I, just, I guess the straight answer to you, Michelle, is I don't know. I think we can see all the shortcomings of the market economy, but what, what, what next is an open question. The only thing I think that I would add to that is we have to recognise that we do not really have an open economy, of course. Governments manage the markets the whole time, mm -hmm. and I don't think we've recognised that enough. Mm. Thank you. Olivier? Um, three remarks, perhaps. Be, one, two of them linked to the comments made on, on the, the Rio Plus 20 agenda, and, and one um, a reflection stimulated by... Um, uh, Michelle's comments. Um, Rio plus 20, I would, like, I would like to say two things. First, there is a, a huge um, untapped potential in agroecological practices, but the um, ability for this to materialize and for these um, ways of producing food that, that respect the ecosystems and, um, and decelerate climate change will need um, a very strong support by the state. It has to be planned, it has to be managed, the transition. And um, um, uh, this is actually the, the, the subject of my next report to the Human Rights Council presented next week, where I try to identify how a strategy could be um, uh, implemented that moves us in this direction. Because I'm very worried that if we do not radically shift course, um, agriculture is really going to hit a wall at some point where um, uh, we, we will simply not be able to, to cope with the uh, challenges that uh, climate change is, is facing us with. So we need to move towards more diverse, resilient systems faster than the market forces themselves will oblige us to. Otherwise, it will be too late when the, once the, the, the impacts will be already felt. Um, and they are actually being felt already. So we need to, to make this transition. Um, Secondly, I think we will not manage uh, to develop sustainable food systems without questioning our lifestyles and our choices, our consumption choices. Um, I could give a number of figures, but uh, I think um, uh, basically um, our uh, overconsumption in developed countries of meat, um, the use of um, agrofuels increasingly that, that uh, put pressure on, on the um, productive uh, resources um, and, and, and have uh, 
energy competes with, with, with food for the use of water and, and, and land, um, and the huge waste in the food systems, uh, particularly after harvests as a result of um, uh, the lack of storage facilities and, and, and transport facilities, um, um, are things we have to act on. And it will not simply do to boost production. Uh, we also have to work on the, on the demand side of the, of the global equation. Um, and simply cleaner technologies will not be enough if we don't question uh, the way our lifestyles have developed and how we, we waste the resources on which we, we rely. And then on, on uh, Michel Pimbert's questions or, or, or suggestions, I think um, one difficulty here is that there is no watertight separation be between um, commodified systems, um, um, markets that, that are based on, um, um, uh, on monetary profit, and the other systems, um, simply because of the opportunity costs involved in not joining the monetized systems. And today, for example, um, if somebody has a choice um, what to do with one's land, uh, and it's much more profitable to sell off the land to an investor wishing to produce cash crops, for example, there is a strong temptation to do so, even though this may not be in the long-term interest of the household concern or of the community concerned. What I mean by this, and this is what indeed Karl Polanyi had uh, very uh, well, I think, articulated, is that um, it is becoming very difficult to maintain outside of the market any good that could be used in ways that are profitable from the point of view of the market. So how are we going to preserve this um, temptation of everything being commoditized? I don't have the answer, but I do, th I, I do see this as a very uh, important challenge. And the current um, wave of, of um, um, large-scale um, um, investments in land with, with uh, communities being deprived of the land because developers um, have plans that could make it more productive according to their parameters is something that is uh, very illustrative of this danger, I think. Do we have any immediate feedback on what Olivia has just said or the question that Diana posed around sort of strengthening local organizations? Does anyone here have experience that they could share around either of these two points? Thank you. Lady in there. Thank you, Katarina Eriksson, Tetra Laval Group. Again, I just very quickly just wanted to say I'm very happy that Olivier took up the, the issue of the, 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 the losses and the waste in the, in the food chain. And as, as a company, we see this all the time. Our customers process not only milk, but also uh, juices and, and a lot of other foods and, and, and beverages. And it's, uh, it's, it's very sad to see, for example, in, 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 in Eastern Africa, how the juice industry imports uh, uh, juice concentrates and uh, enormous amounts of uh, mangoes and, and uh, pineapples uh, go to, goes to waste because there is no system of actually processing them uh, locally. And before talking about producing more, <laughs> um, why not focus on on actually utilizing all the resources that are already there and, and that are going to waste? and an open question to everybody, how can we, how can we help these countries to actually utilize the resources that are al already there? And this is for both small scale and large scale uh, uh, pr producers, of course. And our experience is that it's, 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 um, it's definitely possible to integrate smallholders into industrial value chains. And this is what our customers do all over the world. And we try to support them in that, to build systems whereby you can treat a lot of small farmers as, 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 a, as a larger entity. Small, smaller herds together can be treated as one big herd. Uh, we are working with dairy hubs in, in many countries to, to make this possible so that smallholders can be linked to the, to the value chains and to create those uh, linkages and dependencies where actually, the, for example, the dairies are depending on their farmers to deliver good quality milk, but also farmers being dependent on actually being able to sell all their milk and not only every other day or during uh, half, half of the year, but every day to rely on, uh, on um, a processor actually buying, buying their, their, their products. Thank you. Anything else on this particular issue? Yes, Carol, Edit, and... I'll then come over to the internet for some live questions, Bill. 
Yes, I'm Carol Gripner from HIVOS, Netherlands. I think we, HIVOS was already introduced earlier. I'm very happy with Diana's remark on the need to invest in building strong local organizations because I feel that if we talk about options, it should not be us discussing the options, but it should be them deciding on what are the options and what are the most suitable options for them in their particular settings. And I fully agree with the statement that really in, uh, there, there hasn't been sufficient support for building up such kind of organizations. I recall from the first provocation also that it was mentioned that the large majority of small-scale producers is unorganized. So I think there's a real challenge to, to, to deal with that issue. Uh, and I think, I mean, if we really want to put that higher on the agenda, I think there is a really strong need to build a case for small-scale agriculture. And I think here in the room we are pretty much um, convinced that small-scale producers uh, are productive, uh, can contribute to economic development, food security, climate change and so ever. But I think in the outside world there, there is often a very different view. Eh? I think that's what Edith was also touching upon when she talked about this dichotomy between small and large scale. So I think there's also a huge challenge to build up the case for small scale agriculture. And I, think, I know there have been reports and incidental case studies and so on, but I think the case is still not strong enough. So I would put, like to put that on the floor, like how are we going to build up that case much stronger than mm -hmm. it is right now. Edith, do you want to add to that? You had your hand up. And yeah, well, I had my hand up on a slightly more concrete level, uh, asking you were asking the floor for examples about uh, different types of links between well, links between uh, urban poor and rural poor, Diana was referring to it, and different uh, kind of market models. I'd just like to very briefly refer to what I believe to be a successful uh, experience from Ecuador, where uh, there is a movement of what they call canastas comunitarias, where urban poor have organized themselves, organization comes in here, to procure their own food from groups of producers which are living uh, surrounding uh, the urban areas. And uh, this has really grown into a movement because it has been so successful. I think it's really worth studying more carefully. We had a comment at the back. Uh, thank you. Yeah, just a, a little anecdote. I, I lived in Zimbabwe until 2008 and the economy collapsed totally there. When you have a, a situation where an economy has collapsed, you'd be amazed at how inventive people become in finding new ways and building new markets to solve their own problems. So I think what happened in Zimbabwe is, is one example of how new kinds of markets can emerge under different situations. And then I'm also reminded about the, the transition town movement in the UK, which is another attempt to, to find new kinds of markets and new ways of enabling people to relate to each other and, to, and for towns to relate to, to, to country and to farmers and producers. So these, I think, are all, all very important experiments that are happening right now, and I think it would behold us all to study those a little bit more to help us find alternative kinds of economy to the, the dominant uh, global paradigm. Thank you. Okay, uh, Carol asked us to look at the huge challenge uh, to making a case for small-scale agriculture. You look like you're going. <laughs> <laughs> but I wondered if Engelia, would you, is this something you'd like to respond to, uh, yeah, particularly before Carol goes? <laughs> yeah, I, I think, uh, like I said earlier in my earlier presentation, it's really very much con context specific. Uh, when it comes to uh, the food sovereignty debate, you find very strong movements among the Via Campesina, and they've taken really conceptualize it much further in, in, in its various elements. And um, and actually, right now they have a representation within the, the the Brussels, the European Commission. On the other hand, when you look at the Africa and the, the big move by the big multinationals to to push the green revolution, where where you have GMOs, you have no voice for the civil society. Then then you look at what will be African agriculture look like in the next 10, 20 years when it's all dominated by big seed producers, the Monsantos. So um. 
what I see, and that's what I argued in the beginning, it's, it's, it's important to target uh, support to, to these movements, to these farmers' organizations, to build their capacity for policy analysis. And if you look at the, the, uh, the political advocacy that actually happened during the WTO negotiations and the G7, G8 uh, meetings, the, it, it actually forced them to change policies when they, they had a lot of demonstrations in the last meeting in Seattle. So I, I believe there is possible possibility to, to change the, the arrangements that we have today, look for other alternatives. Uh, it, it's a question of how we, we build capacity and, and, and the kind of support we give to, to farm organizations. And I, I really want to, to agree with Diana. Sometimes we, we, we underplay the role of, of government. They are, they are very key in this, and um, not only in the, in, the, in the north, but also in the south. And um, uh, somehow I, I feel in the, in the, in the current uh, negotiations, um, uh, what what you find uh, uh, right now it's a, it's very unequal power relations between um, the, the, the 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 bilateral agreements you know be, uh, either between the U.S. and 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 the and the, the, and the, the, the Central America Latin America or between the the, the 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 European Commission and Africa and the Economic Partnership agreements. So there there are key key areas where I think uh, in the current debate where. The, we need to scrutinize, we need to look at them, and um, have a stronger you know, voice among the civil, civil society to, to lobby against uh, those arrangements. Thank you. Any further comments on this challenge from the floor? Because I'm going to go in a moment to uh, our live stream and gather some questions from there. Um, I, 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 I'm speaking too much, but I'll keep it no, very please. short. This, no, this I'm sure people between do uh, short, small scale and, and large scale. I think it's the, the key issue to, to look at is um, externalities uh, produced by um, uh, both types of farming. And with this proviso that there are many different types of small scale farming, it's a continuum in fact. A small family farmer in Brazil is not, you know, a small farm in Rwanda, which, no, which has, no, you know, different. less than half a hectare to cultivate. Yeah. In Brazil, if you have 50 hectares, you're still a small family farm, right? Mm -hmm. It depends on the, on yeah, the state. Yeah, depends but, where you are. Um, so there are many, but, but essentially we could say this, that um, the prices are lying. Uh, the prices of food are lying because um, there are um, uh, benefits from certain types of farming that, uh, for which the farmers are not rewarded, and there are negative externalities which are not accounted for in the price of food that we consume. And small-scale farming is creating employment, contributing to rural development for this reason. It is better at preserving the ecosystems because it um, is easier for small farmers to combine various plants and trees and animals on the same plot of land which is labor intensive and requires that the farmer be linked to the land. Um, on large scale farms which uh, practice monocropping, um, it's much more difficult to practice um, 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 ecologically sound farming per, per definition, I would say. So there are negative externalities from, from um, uh, certain types of farming which are not accounted for in the price of food. And, um, uh, and, and, and finally, um, when the incomes of small farmers increase, it creates a market for services, for uh, 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 producers of goods in the country, um, which benefits other sectors of the economy in ways in which the increased incomes for the large fazendero, the, the, the large landowner, do not benefit the, the local economy. Because mostly uh, when those uh, large landowners uh, um, have their incomes increase, they will buy imported goods or they will buy luxury items, but they will not contribute to um, a, a sort of multiplying effect on the local economy. So for all these reasons, it is important to support small-scale farming, um, which, um, uh, which, which produces these positive externalities for which it is not rewarded generally. But the single most important reason is that simply that is where the poor are. And so by, by, by investing in them, we actually can contribute to combat rural poverty, which is still, we have to recall, 75% uh, of the, of the, of the uh, world's poor are still living in the, in the rural areas. Okay. 
We've got one more. We've got a couple of com comments here. And this lady at the top. Okay, there's a question about does the finance collapse represents an opportunity in a way to reshape markets in favor of financial in favor of small farmers? Let's collect two or three comments. Have, have you do you have another one? And then we can so the first one was related to the financial collapse, yeah. And the second one um, refers to a report that I don't think anyone have mentioned yet that I, I believe is quite important, and it's the IISTD, the mm -hmm. most uh, <laughs> difficult name to pronounce, the International Agricultural Assessment on Science, Technology and Development mm -hmm. from 2008. And this uh, question comes from Plena Luz, um, and she says that this report from 2008, IAASTD, Report, Agriculture at the Crossroads, concludes the following. Business as usual is not an option. Mm -hmm. uh, André González referred to, the market, to markets as social constructions and as constructions uh, can be changed and deconstructed. What kind of adjustments uh, or modifications of this social construction are needed for a new paradigm, paradigm towards agroecological production and consumption? I think we've touched upon this, but thank you. So we have a couple of questions there on so the financial issues. We had some comments here and here. I just wanted to check if they were for now. Uh, in a couple of minutes, do you want to feed them in? Were they in response to Olivier's comments before? You'll th have a think. <laughs> no. I don't want to complicate this. Uh, uh, no, no, my, my question is related to myself as uh, working in a don donor agency. Uh, there was a discussion here, well, there's a kind of agreement about the importance of small-scale farming. Somebody said that uh, maybe this is just within the room, then out there you don't find the same acceptance. Well, I think there's a lot of agreement, rhetorical agreement perhaps, about the importance of small-scale farms. And just remind about the World Bank, the World Development Report a couple of years ago uh, emphasized that. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of getting a bit concerned here, or my, my, my question is, is small-scale farming synonymous with the right-based approach? Or, so what would be the, the uh, rights-based approach more, more in, in these terms? And, and, of course, working at the donor agency, I would ask myself what, kind, in what, what would be the implication for us if we seriously would like to apply a rice-based approach in our support. I heard from our Ministry of Agriculture, Department of Agriculture, that, that our government is moving in that direction. I'm also a bit curious then of knowing a bit more clearly what does it mean, because I'm not sure that we are working in those lines at CEDA right now. Mm -hmm. okay. Bill, do, did you want to add something? No, just to really you just... Okay. Do your comment at the back, did you? Of course, everything is all intricately Absolutely. linked together <laughs> and independent, interdependent. But um, when when listening to the, the, the positive and negative, compa the comparison of the positive and negative externalities of small-scale farming and large-scale farming, you know, it, it does seem to be quite an awful lot of evidence that we've been gathering, gathering um, as to which is, the, which is a good development paradigm. Um, so uh, without wishing to be too provocative, I, I'd like to ask the panel to, to maybe especially Olivier say, well, how far has this conversation and this this uh, evidence-based approach gone um, in changing the uh, the the support from from the uh, international community? Because clearly, um, I mean, we have now TEB. I don't know if you know it's part of the part of Achim Steiner's uh, group in the UN, the Green Economy, the uh, Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity, which pr tries to put numbers on the, uh, both the positive and negative externalities of different economic activities, whether you destroy or preserve an ecosystem or biodiversity, try to put numbers on, on this. So we have quite a lot of evidence that there are clearly different forces 
of special interests working, it would be very nice to hear how is the conversation going, for example, in the FAO, for example, uh, we were talking about how governments can choose which development paradigm to support. Where, where are the obstacles? Can, can we talk about those? Thank you. <laughs> okay, I think, um, Michelle, is it the same point? Okay, we'll take a comment from Michelle. Then I'd like to ask the panel if they could respond to, we had some questions from uh, our live streamers on the kind of financial implications. We've got this small scale rights-based approach. What are the implications for, for donors in particular or others? And then how, what is the, this, the evidence that we have? How is it changing the conversation at a kind of international higher level? So if we could come back to you panel for those. Michelle, add your points. And then we'll do that. Yeah, it's prompted by your remarks about donors who are increasingly hearing in official documents and philanthropic foundation the need to invest in small-scale farming. Great. Um, however, I think we have to look fairly critically at what is meant by that and what's been proposed and what are the intentionalities. Um, it, it's certainly true that there are some farmers, whether small-scale, medium-scale or large-scale, who do want to become more entrepreneurial and link up to national global markets. That's true. But equally, I think there's growing evidence now to suggest that both in the North, well, to show, not suggest, that both in the North and the South, there are more and more farmers who quite consciously want, consciously want to distance themselves from markets. They're trying to invent new forms of uh, modernity, new peasantries, uh, that stress values of autonomy and self-determination. This is an important phenomenon, uh, which is still off the radar screen of a lot of policy think tanks and donor organizations, but I think it's an uncontestable reality, both in the South and the North. It's the product of local organizations in the rural space organizing themselves and mobilizing to make other alternatives happen. Why is it important to differentiate these new peasants from the agrarian entrepreneurs? I think the entrepreneurs, they, they mainly develop their farming by linking into commodity markets for seeds, for chemical fertilizers, for synthetic pesticides and other industrial inputs. This is the model proposed by Agra in Africa, yeah. your yeah. point. Yeah. Uh, with the backing of foundations yes. um, mm -hmm. and protagonists of the new green revolution. Mm -hmm. Now these farmers actively replace naturally available assets such as farm seeds, organic manure, local knowledge uh, on crop protection with purchased inputs uh, provided by increasingly monopolistic corporations who sit on different points in the food chain. Now, peasant farmers, particularly the new kinds in the south and, south and now north, they're increasingly trying to distance themselves from these markets for farm inputs um, by embarking on agroecological approaches, bringing back biodiversity in their food systems, and designing their farm landscapes in such a way that they sponsor their own soil fertility, their own internal pest management systems through biological control, intercropping, um, and also locally bred um, farm seeds and livestock breeds. So relying much more on internal resources, local knowledge and agroecological science, which is highly complex, as well as cooperative between, cooperation between local organizations. So they try and work with living nature to reduce their dependency on suppliers of off-farm inputs. This is important, and when we, when we think about small scales and the small scale farmers or medium scale farmers and what they could be doing and where donors can invest their money, I think this distinction is important. Mm -hmm. Equally on the output side, these new peasantry is often in association with urban consumers, uh, also seek to distance themselves from food processing companies, supermarkets and so on. They're trying to develop new rules of the game by developing new um, uh, food webs, uh, citizen consumer groups um, in response to global and national markets uh, that are controlled by corporations and are actively generating ill health, malnutrition and huge inequities in societies. 
uh, within societies and between societies. You just have to look at the profits of Tesco and so on, and it's just shocking at a time when there's less and less uh, for most people. So I think this distinction is important. I, it's great that the uh, concept of small-scale farmer is back on the map of international institutions, but there is a trap unless one is very clear about what kind of model of production, what kinds of economic relationships uh, one supports. Where is the public sector money going to be put and who's going to gain in the end? I think this is critically important. So I that you ask a direct question, I'm <laughs> doing a direct <laughs> answer. But maybe, maybe the panelists would also have things yeah. to add on this because Brazil, Africa, yeah. Yeah. Um, Thanks, Michelle. Does, before I ask Ngalia to reply, me, has anyone else got anything to add on that precise point about farmers distancing themselves from markets? We've got three comments. I'd then like the panel to respond, and then I would like to say we should be drawing to a close after that with our next round of questions. So after the panel's responded, I think we'll go for the next major round of questions. So we've got a comment there. Comment there and comment there. And if you could keep them nice and concise, that would be welcome. Okay, my name is Anders Ekbom. I've been at the University of Gothenburg. Uh, I think I understood what you said, but uh, frankly, from my own research and also looking at sort of statistics globally, I, I don't see that uh, happening. I think it's rather the opposite that uh, farmers, small-scale farmers, are more and more drawn into uh, the global markets. I can just take Kenya as an example. I mean, 20, 30, 40 years, years ago, they grew cassava, sorghum, uh, potatoes, um, and also coffee. And now it's, they all produce fruits, and nuts, uh, cut flowers, and other things uh, are becoming more and more commercial. And I think that's the global pattern. And uh, one can wish, I think there are, you, you're true to some extent, but what I see globally, uh, it's, it's rather the opposite trend that uh, farmers are more and more drawn into the global, global market uh, through, through producing new crops, um, becoming more commercial in, on the input side. So, um, but I think the way forward is not to throw out one in favor of the other. I think it's rather to optimizing uh, the two, uh, the, mo the modern kinds of crops, um, inputs that can be used um, in, in, um, in a productive manner with traditional knowledge, traditional soil and water conservation systems or measures. And But I think there is a, a huge challenge here in uh, tying research that is done in developing countries with extension advice to farmers and to reduce the yield gaps between research, not only the traditional sort of modern type, in quotation, uh, kind of research on agricultural intensification, but research based on integrated soil fertility management, uh, integrated water management, uh, integrating it with uh, agroforestry, livestock, etc. I think the way forward is not to choose one or the other, but rather combining uh, these two kinds of agriculture, if you will. Um, maybe a little on the side, but given that the IASTAD uh, report was mentioned, and that is probably the most acknowledged report on agriculture ever having been written, um, but still not mainstream knowledge. Um, shouldn't we demand of the UN system that there were made a type of report in the vein of oh, IPCC or TEB or whatever, which focuses on agriculture uh, at the crossroads we are now seeing? Because it seems to me as if there are so many major decisions uh, to be made and there are so many questions up in the air uh, which need to be addressed and on a global level. Maybe that should have been done and thought of uh, earlier uh, concerning this uh, b b b Rio plus 20 which is coming up. That would have been maybe the natural place to have had such a report being published.
can also be the place to lobby for such a report. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I think um, I think that donors and governments have got a, a really tough problem in front of them because they try and look for some fairly simple solution to what is really a very complex problem. And just picking up on what Michelle was saying, if you think about small scale and large scale and where they occur in different parts of the world and the different, the very different local social and ecological context within which they occur, and then you try and pull together um, aggregate data which tells us which way the world is going in terms of its agricultural systems, I think you're going to get into an awful lot of trouble. So we need to rethink the way in which we prepare policy and, and be prepared to look at things in a lot more detail at the local or regional level or at the level of scale which makes sense to the kinds of <coughs> ecological and social environment within which the farming system occurs. It's, it, it makes it a whole lot more difficult, but it's, uh, speaking as somebody who's taken an interest in resilience, thinking and the application of complex systems to these kinds of problems, it, the kinds of tools that you need to help unravel these problems are around, and it's, um, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to putting them into practice anyway. Thank you. Pa Panelists, we have quite a challenging yeah. set of issues to yeah. talk to. Um, we had the financial collapse, we had the implications of rights-based um, approach to small-scale farming, we've had distancing from markets. I think there's a question for nearly all of you to respond. Um, Engelia, you were kind of fired yeah, up yeah, and yeah. so <laughs> we'll start with you. <laughs> Thank you. It's just a comment on the collapse of the financial markets, although I, I doubt because when you look at the statistics on Wall Street, they have recovered extremely very fast. So, um, I mean, there is a rethinking on, on the cooperative model, for, for instance. Uh, right now it's, um, it's looking very attractive and um, it, it's not uh, as in the past in the neoliberal discourse it was looked upon as very inefficient. And uh, we have seen some very successful, for instance, dairy cooperatives in all over coming up very well managed and adding value to the members. And... Um, it's also a democratically controlled way of owning business. Um, so I, I see a lot of opportunity. And when you look at the, the actual cooperative entities, uh, big cooperative banks, they were not so much affected by the financial downturn that happened in 2008. So I think there is a lot of opportunity, uh, as uh, the question was asked. And um, we, we are moving qu quite fast in this and uh, to, you know, developing the, 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 the values and, and systems of production based on cooperatives, uh, you know, building new, you know, working with the producers to, um, to, to strengthen new uh, cooperatives. Uh, but of course, as we know very well in, in some of the countries, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, the cooperatives have had a very, very bad uh, reputation in the past. They were really controlled by the state. But the, um, the new method of working is, is, is very much driven by, by, the, by the movement, by the farmers themselves. So I, I think there is a, a lot of scope. We have very successful cooperatives in, in, in Central America and South America that have a, a, quite a long uh, chunk share in, in, in the local markets and regional markets. So there is a big scope. Just a very quick uh, comment on the... Um, on what Lasse asked about the, uh, the donors and... Uh, how they see support to smallholder agriculture. I, I, I think it's more what uh, Anders said is really to optimize both and, uh, and really not um, fall into the trap of very simplistic analysis. And also, like you see, very, very uh, what's happening now is to, to demand results very quickly. And we know these are the processes, as Michelle, Michelle mentioned, that, uh, that you, you will not get, um, you know, immediate results if very quick uh, uh, transformation of smallholder farmers we we, we know it, it's a uh, and and i think if if you if you if you look at the the development um for instance what was mentioned by, by andres in, in 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 brazil i mean it's 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 possible to optimize both and uh, really target uh, support to to smallholder farmers and the organization to, to, to have a voice in the market as, as well as uh, build the, 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 um, 
their membership and i think they, they, are, they are quite good tools for developing organization quite actually modeled along business the, the balance scorecard system <laughs> We have a system for civil society that we call the octagon tool. It's actually, when you look at it, it's a balanced scorecard system used in the private sector. And, uh, you know, they are there and they can, you know, with very good targeted um, donor support, I think it's, it's a, there is a lot of scope for building smallholder organizations. Andre. Can I go? Yeah. Um, the first question is about the report. Someone asked about the report. There is an international study, this IIASTD or something like that. I was part of this study, was led by the, a guy from the World Bank who was also at the IPCC, if I'm not wrong, Bob Watson, which is a very complete assessment of the state of the agriculture in the world. And it's pretty much pro-smallholder, pro organic agriculture, and uh, I think it worth read the, the, this report. And uh, you ask about the you, you somewhat uh, talk about the pattern, and uh, I think that even though the pattern right now it's pro -global globalization or opening the markets, and uh, and I think it's time to watch for the outliers. And I think there's a lot of very nice examples out there, and I learned in the statistics that when we want to see a different picture, we will have to look for the outliers. So I think it's time to look for the outliers. And what I'm referring to outliers here are these examples that are combining income for farmers, environmental services, and food production. I think these three challenges that we have, it should be combined. We have to have one answer that can be, I mean, agricultural systems that can provide environmental service, produce food, and generate income for farmers. And I truly believe that we have many, many examples and, uh, in, in, in the world. And I, of course, I have to talk about the examples in Brazil and pretty much related with what you, you said, Michel, about going beyond this, the way that we see economy. And I think there's a lot of examples. One of the examples that I would like to mention, I mean, it's, it's a tiny example, but again, it's, I see as an outlier that can be a source of inspiration for another example is uh, a network of organic farmers, of ecological farmers called Ecovida in southern Brazil. And what we are doing is to exchange products within a big region of the country. When, when one region doesn't have a product, we just, we have circuits of commercialization. And since we are a, a, an organization with more than 3,000 farmers, we are much more powerful to, to, to have this uh, relation with market, with big corporation, etc. And I think these are tiny examples, but I think it can be very illustrative. Anyone on the panel, PV? Um, I, I, I want to make two comments on the issue raised by our friend from the Gothenburg University. What you say may be true in terms of the spread of um, market inputs into agriculture in, in numbers. But I think very few people have gone behind that and see the reality of why that is happening. Let me illustrate it with one example of the genetically engineered cotton from India, BT cotton. And within uh, six years of its cultivation now, the ISAAA has gone to town claiming that 90% of India's cotton production is based on BT cotton, which is true. But when you uh, go and ask a farmer why does he or she grow BT cotton, what's wrong with the uh, other cotton that they were growing, all that they would say that no seed is available of the local cotton anymore. So the seed producers have become a cartel. They have blocked the uh, old hybrid cotton seed coming to the farmer. So the farmer is today growing under duress the BT cotton. And what is the consequence, the other uh, face of reality? Within five years, from 0% of the soil which has become toxic through rhytotectania, uh, a kind of a root rot disease 
that beca comes because of the uh, that came because of the Bt cotton from 2 percent of the soil it has spread to 40 to 45 percent of the soil within five years. So in terms of immediate profit what the farmer is sacrificing is his entire survival base that is soil number uh, problem number uh, two. And third point in the same area is what Dr. Stone, a very distinguished anthropologist from United States who studied these cotton farmers for two years, he has raised an issue that is complete de-skilling of the farmers. Farmers who used to know what to grow and how to grow it have completely lost that capacity because of the externalities of seeds and other uh, chemicals. So today they can't make a decision of their own. They have to depend upon the a decision made for some somebody else including their own government and multinational seed companies. So this is one part. The other part, Olivia told me that I must mention this. The, mar the market of the women, which we call the market of the walkouts, we don't use the word dropout because they have not dropped out of the larger market because they are incapable of it, but they have deliberately walked out of that market because they don't like to work and engage with that market. This market of the walkouts over 10 years has grown by 30 times, grown 30 times. And like I said, all the farmers have year after year made between 35 uh, percent to 120 percent of dividends they have earned. Therefore, keeping their own principles intact, managing it democratically and not letting go the principles of ecology and biodiversity, they have been able to make it. Why isn't the government of India or a donor agency studying this market which offers you the all kinds of equalities that you are talking about, gender equality, the um, uh, the, the, the equity between different sections of the society, the, the market of the excluded people. Why is it being so successful? Why is that not being supported? And my last point is while the rest of India shows us uh, 250,000 farmer suicides, this region uh, has not recorded a single suicide in the last uh, 10 years. That means here it is supporting life whereas the other market is supporting money. So what do you want to choose from? Thank you. And on that note, I'm going to draw us to the final closing part of our meeting. Sorry? Uh, we're going to draw, we have time, we need to draw to a close. Um, when you came in, I asked you the question, um, what should development cooperation priorities be? I asked those of you to raise your hands if you believed it should be rights first or markets second. And then a very couple of people said they thought markets first or rights second. <laughs> I won't be asking you that question again, but one of the reasons we asked it was to get you thinking about what your thoughts were, what your impressions were. And we're thinking now, what is your learning from today? So first of all, I'm going to ask the panelists um, as a closing contribution to do a, literally the smallest kind of takeaway. What, what, have, what are you going to take away from today that has perhaps been a different insight, perhaps a different perspective, or will lead you to think about something new or explore something new? And then if there are any comments from the floor, we'll take one or two after the panelists and then say thank you and goodbye. Who'd like to kick off with that challenge? I haven't given you much time <laughs> to collect your thoughts, but we're really talking a minuscule snapshot to just close, close us down for the day. Uh, Diana's ready, I think, and then Olivier, and then Ingolia. Am I ready? Um. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I probably have the easiest job because it's been so new to me, and uh, <laughs> I thank you for your patience. I mean, to me, what, it's, what it has emphasised is the comment I made before about the need perhaps to think more holistically about groups who are experiencing disadvantage in our, um, the areas and countries in which we work, and to think of potentially kind of fertile links between groups who are dependent on markets for food and those who are producers. I mean, that to me, it's really highlighted that as a theme within my work. Thank you. Olivier? Well, I think 
we are now in a situation where there's a largely shared diagnosis at the level of discourse about what needs to be done. Uh, the switch towards supporting small-scale uh, farmers practicing uh, agroecological methods. Um, however, there are huge obstacles in making this transition which everybody believes is necessary. And part of this is a disbelief uh, by policymakers that this is achievable. Part of the obstacle is also uh, a sense that we need to produce more and that we can only produce more by more of the same agro-industrial types of practice. And part of this is, of course, the impacts of the um, commodification of the food systems and, and the, the requirements of the, of the trade uh, of the markets, which do not reward the kind of farming that we need to have rewarded. And so what we need to do is basically do what ISTAD has not done the International Assessment on Agricultural Sciences and Technologies for Development. It's a very deep and well-informed report about the state of agriculture, but the reason why it has been less influential than it should be is because there is no strategy associated to this. There's no pathway. We know what the end vision should be, but we don't know what the itinerary should be that can lead us there, so that it looks utopian, it looks unrealistic to achieve, and it looks revolutionary, and people only are comfortable with the small steps that are more reformist than revolutionary. So what we need to do is develop this strategy, this multi-year uh, pathway that can lead us from today to that um, not-so-distant future if we identify the specific measures that we need to take. There is a place where this can be done, and that is uh, the Committee on World Food Security, which is one um, important forum where such issues can be discussed on the global level and which shall develop over the next year a global strategic framework which is a sort of plan of action for the international community and I believe that uh, the ISTAD report should be uh, one of the major, uh, one of the most important documents that should guide the development of this strategy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Who else? Yes, uh, I think that my final word it's about the sense of urgency. I believe that we already have enough evidence. It's not a matter of having more studies, more. I'm not saying that this is not important. But I think that we already have enough information and enough evidence that smallholder agriculture can um, produce enough food, produce environmental service, and generate income for farmers. It's that. Thank you. Galea. Yeah, I'm more and more convinced that the, the way to go is the, the rights based approach to supporting smallholder farmers. And up somebody asked us what are we thinking about the, what is happening in North Africa. Maybe maybe I think the solution lies outside the conventional wisdom. And uh, somehow I, I believe very soon we'll reach a tipping point where it will become a necessity rather than a, a debate issue because uh, it's rather critical. It's um, it's very obvious with the with the externalities of the climate change that that we need to to give support to to smallholder farmers, and uh, very soon I believe probably they will demand it before we 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 even take it to them. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, PB. Um, I never thought that what I listen to and learn on a day-to-day -day basis from this community of very small women farmers would get such a resounding uh, um, support, endorsement from a global community like this. It gives me a great hope. And uh, I think apart from the different nuances that are brought here, the overwhelming, uh, um, like I said, endorsement is something that will add a lot of strength to my work. And that's my takeaway. Take away. Thank you. Can I? Just a final advertisement. <laughs> is, I'm sorry, there is a, a report uh, which was sponsored by the Swedish Society for Nature Conservation. And there are copies in Swedish and in English. We don't have copies for everyone, right, Karin? And thank thank you. you. Is there anyone in the audience, one or two people, who would like to give a takeaway? This gentleman here. Well, thank you, and I've been listening carefully uh, this afternoon. I'm Henning Enval from the uh, Foreign Ministry here. I deal with multilateral development cooperation, uh, mainly World Food Program and FAO. And uh, I, maybe I, I'd like to thank Diana Mitlin for, for uh, sort of challenging the uh, 
sort of widespread belief in the state in this this audience and indeed in some cases even central planning um, there are things that the government could do I uh, for example in the global discourse um, uh, challenging um, export bans that don't necessarily um, drive up prices um, and uh, affecting uh, poor people and uh, we could support agricultural development which she that does which the government does uh, agricultural development uh, science we could give um, uh, through the world food program food assistance to the people where it really doesn't work at all um, but uh, I mean, could I remind people that the, the big story of development over the last three decades or so isn't that millions and millions of entrepreneurs in Asia that have lifted hundreds of millions of people uh, out of po poverty and in the process taking a lot of a number of countries on course to achieving the first millennium development goal on hunger. So it, before we sort of chuck out the standard economics textbooks and go for alternative economics and, and uh, even as was suggested in the panel, using the uh, common agricultural policy on the, of the European Union as a good example, um, I'd be willi willing to challenge that at any time. Thank you. Okay, I think it's time to say thank you very much indeed. Firstly, thank you very much. I'm sure you'll all applaud our speakers for today. Thank you very much indeed to all of you for your inspiring contributions. I would like to thank you, the audience, for staying with us and continuing to contribute good ideas, both in the building here and online. Uh, we haven't obviously been able to answer every question and contribution, but thank you for having made them. I'd like to thank our colleagues from One World who have been doing the live streaming. Uh, thank you for that. Um, and also our organisers, for our host, our partners in these series of provocations. Our next provocation is on the 30th of March. It is in Paris with SMV and IRAM, and it's on making markets work for the poor and its discontents. It will be online if you can't make it in person. And then we have other provocations in May and June, which you will also find online if you visit the address on the bottom of this leaflet. I think that's me finished. Thank you very much. <laughs>